the married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, don't want to cure it, many questions remain unanswered as Keir Starmer dodges quizzing over Angela Brainy's taxes. And Britain's addicted to foreign social care workers as migrant salaries drop well below the threshold required to maintain controls on immigration. Plus, the biggest astronomical event of the decade is millions of people queue with excitement, apparently, to catch the blockbuster eclipse. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. There's another huge week coming up. We're kick-starting it all tonight. I'll be telling you how councils up and down the country are rinsing us for £2 billion a year, and now they want even more. I'll be telling you how your GP is making more money than ever, and how some of them are even raking in over £1 million a year. And I'll be telling you why it's not just about money. We are, in fact, suffering from a complete and utter eclipse of common sense. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Let's fire up the rockets. And now to our top story. Sir Keir Starmer has been warned that his reputation is on the line after photographs were uncovered and appear to show Labour's deputy leader living at an address that she insists was not her home. Angela Rayner has faced ongoing scrutiny amid claims that she may have avoided capital gains tax on the sale of her former council house by failing to declare her real address. She's maintained she lived apart from her husband and children for the first five years of her marriage and she denies any wrongdoing. But the story refuses to go away. Let's get a reaction to this and an awful lot more that's going on. First night of the Independent Republic. Here we go. Uh, journalist Laura Dodsworth is here, Director of Communications at the Henry Jackson Society, Megan Gittos, and Talk TV's estimable contributor, Esther Cracker. Very good evening to all of you. And here we are. You know, yeah. apparently it's a bad omen, um, an eclipse. It talks about, I've been looking up all the superstitions about it, and apparently a total eclipse means that, uh, depending on which part of the world you live in, there's a new beginning. Uh, we can go live and see it actually happening. There you go. Uh, wow. It's a new beginning. Wow. Uh, it is a kind of... Um, it is a, it's a bad omen for some people. It means that they need to cleanse themselves and start again. It could mean that something really terrible is going to happen, apparently. The last time I seem to remember this happening was about 1999, I think, and everybody rushed down to Cornwall. Um, nothing particularly terrible happened in 2000, did it? There was the one where Donald we did Trump... He, 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 quit, he quipped. There was a, a I mean, it's been a disaster ever since, hasn't it? The whole <laughs> century <laughs> since 2000 exactly. has been a nightmare. We had 9-11, yeah. we've had the Iraq war, we've had the Taliban, yeah. we've now got, you know, what's okay. going on in Joe Russia. Joe Biden presidency. We've got Joe Biden coming in as president. Uh, we had Gordon Brown. I mean, you know, it, we, it's, it hasn't, nothing's been wow. good since then. eclipses roll on regularly and life rolls on regularly, doesn't it? But that looks spectacular. It does look that pretty good. Yeah, amazing. Cool. I just said... Apparently, so. lots of people booked to get married during yes. it. Yes. How strange, though, that to get married strange. and then suddenly it's dark as you're saying your vows. And apparently, That normally happens later in marriage. I think they're doing it in somewhere <laughs> weird like Kansas. Um, and apparently they've got so much cloud there, they're not going to be able to see the eclipse. So there, there goes the marriage vows. You know, you start <laughs> off immediately being disappointed <laughs> because we were supposed to see something great. Um, but I believe there is a total eclipse of common sense going on, actually. That's Absolutely, what I'd like yeah. to talk mm -hmm. about. But let's kick things off with, with Angela Rayner because this story now has been banging around for about, what, a month? Yeah. And, you, I mean, normally speaking, it was Alistair Campbell himself who said, if you're the story for more than six days, you should get out of the job. Yeah, and how would you make it go away? Maybe by releasing the tax advice yeah. that she had. That would make it go yes, away. Yes, or maybe she, giving an interview about it. She's perhaps. not. She's not. She's not really the first socialist, though, to be really in favour of taxes until it comes to paying them yourself. Yes. I was talking to a good friend of mine who's definitely much more left-wing than me, and mm. they were really defending the kind of current tax burden right. that we're under at the moment. Which is saying, huge, by the way. Yeah, and saying they believe in taxes because it enables the redistribution of wealth, which, of course, it doesn't. <laughs> but then, do you know what? The very next time I saw that friend in the space of about a week, yeah. they were asking me to witness legal documents to make sure their children didn't pay inheritance tax. Isn't that a funny thing? So that's the thing. Everyone well, always the believes thing. in taxes I don't, 
they don't have care. To pay I mean, this is a very, relatively small amount of money compared to some of the Conservative, you know, ministers that have mm. been up against all sorts of tax um, questions. And I, but that's not what I worry about. I worry about hypocrisy, and I worry about Angela Rayner, who loves holding people to account and is so scared of actually a addressing the issue. Yeah, that's the thing for me. It's mostly the hypocrisy of the whole right. thing. Um, she, you know, she her position in the Labour Party is kind of she's a Rottweiler. She really calls so out. Very the quiet at the moment. Very quiet. Rottweiler. Very quiet at the moment. Um, but it she was must the, have been muzzled. It was the same with the Lib Dems, with the post office yeah. stuff. They're very quick to call on everyone else to resign, yes. and then when it happens to them, kind of moan that it's a toxic right. politics. And I just think it reeks of hypocrisy. And I, I mean, think you can't expect people to remain quiet and not. I think that's why she's been yeah. the story for so long. If she wasn't someone that was constantly calling for others to resign, right. this I think people would. And also, all of these it. stories, Esther, as well. And I know I saw you on the talk, and I know yeah, you don't it's think not it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a big. But I tell you what, I tell you why it is though. It's partly because I think she's been so clear about saying that it was definitely not her second home. Yeah. And if she hadn't said any of that. That would be one thing. But they've now uncovered pictures of her. Just they've got neighbours who say, well, she was never living there. Yeah. We've got, you know, removal men saying, when we went to move the, the stuff from there, there was nothing in it. You know, we've got people saying from the other house that that was where she went. We've now got a picture of her saying, I'm home with my cats in the house that she shared with her yeah. husband. And it is pretty unusual, you'd have to say, mm -hmm. to, to insist that for the first five years of your marriage, you didn't live in the same yeah, house that, as your that's, husband. That's, that's and none of it makes pretty... any sense. And if she hadn't done all of that, Nobody would have cared. Yeah, that's clearly a lie. And there's clearly a lot of inconsistency going on here. I think I think the reason why I, this is not a big deal for me is because I feel like people are concerned with something bigger. Yes, it's, it's hypocritical, but the bigger problem is the caliber of our politicians. Yes. Right, the fact that we have to go after politicians for a potential breach of 1,500 quid maximum. Yeah. There's a bigger issue here. If we were, if we didn't feel like we were being taxed out, like, you know, to the, to within an inch of our lives, mm. that taxes weren't so ruinous in this country, we, we, we yeah. really wouldn't care. This is not the first sort of hypocritical socialist. Come on. Now. Like, you know, the Labour well, no, they're all hypocrites. But I think the bigger problem is the tax code is too complicated. Oh, you don't have to pay capital gains on your first home, but you, you have to pay on your second home, except if you do improvements on it and you can, you yeah. can get that deducted. It's all, we have yeah. such a complicated tax code. Keep things simple, keep t taxes low, stop delegating it to useless people, stop filling Westminster with useless politicians. That's what people are But again, with, not surely with we expect better as, as taxpayers. If our leading politicians, and she is a leading politician, she wants to be mm. in the government, uh, if they get re if they get elected, which looks like it's going to happen, and she is basically incapable of answering a straight question, incapable of sorting out a very small problem, mm. which most people would have said, you know what, I can't remember what I did. Uh, I'll check back, and if I made a mistake, I'll be happy to pay the money. You know, fifteen hundred quid, whatever it was. You know, just get on with it. But but instead, she's now created this web of kind of you know weirdness where people are saying, why doesn't she just tell the truth? She's made it 10 times dodgier she than, has. It, than it potentially ever needed to be. Although, of course, the risk is it genuinely is really dodgy. Yeah. You know, all, yeah. of the, all of the evidence looks really terrible. And it is, it is this kind of attack dog role that she's had before, which makes it so much worse. Yeah. You know, she really led the charge against Nadim Sahawi, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, she did. When um, he was under scrutiny for his tax affairs, was it yeah. you know, a year ago? And he ago, ended up so. just paying back, what, two million quid or something, right? Yeah, he, yeah he, he was just, just he was just upfront yeah. about it all. Right. It's the fact that she's um, she's not released this so-called yeah, tax right. advice. He was actually sorry for interrupting. He was, he was actually he very, was very upfront about, about it. it. Yeah, exactly. And, and it I went mean, over. He resigned right. as well, and it went away within a couple of days. Yeah. yeah. Well, she's she's absolutely not going to resign because she fancies herself the boudicca of the left. Oh, I think the it may left, come to the that, left though. sees her as the boudicca of the left, yeah. though. And so I think that's why well, she's that, not being. It didn't end very well for boudicca. It didn't. It did not end well for boudicca. Yeah, she can have a statue of Westminster Bridge, but. <laughs> she didn't actually do too well. Yeah. But that's funny because um, we've got the, 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 the latest from Guido is that the Facebook campaign that Angela Rayner was about to front has now been dropped by mm. Labour, so they're not going to put her out as, as a sort of yeah. Facebook Well, they're candidate. hoping it will die down, yeah, but well, it's not going to go away. But it away. isn't going to go away. Yeah. Uh, but also David Lammy was sent out yesterday to, to do the kind of bidding for, for, for Angela Rayner, and the best he could muster was everyone's picking on her because she's a working-class woman from the north of England. Really? He oh, actually awful. said worse than that. He said something about, um, I was speaking to someone, and they played me a clip that, wasn't it, you know, the Conservatives are the government, so that was they're also actually what he said, yeah. held to a higher standard. Yes. You're about to be the government. Right. So yeah. if we'd found out about this story a year later, right. 
It's yeah. just, it's just, it smacks of just an awful lot of excuses. And lack of self-awareness. You know, and lack of um, just owning up to things. And I think a lot of MPs have this problem. They don't own up. I mean, we can yeah. go back to last week. I came back from America to that incredibly ridiculous story uh, of the Tory MP in the honey trap scenario, mm. you know. And then luckily, because the Times went to him, he actually came clean and said, yeah, it was me. Um, I got myself stuck into Grindr. Um, Willie Rag, I think his name is. Uh, which is an unfortunate name in the best of times. Um, <laughs> and he went, you know, and he seems to have now got away with it. You know, they're all going, oh, um, oh, he's a very a great guy, very straightforward. He's given away numbers of people who are in government. He's given away telephone numbers of sensitive individuals to some scam artist at the very least. And I mean, I can't understand why he hasn't been kicked out of the Tory party. Um, I think because he is leaving. And he's... he's yeah, but like so what? But again. what I'm saying is, is that this whole Westminster sort of... Shower of... Oh, I can't Sleaze. even say the word. Sleaze is a good one. Yeah. Um, I was thinking of another word beginning with S. They don't, they don't seem to understand what the rest of the world is like. Well, you the know, thing is, we do have... Do something we wrong. Have, uh, hold your have, hands up. Have, Get out. We have high standards for politicians, but we, we're, we're wondering why we're not recruiting to the, to the calibre that we expect. And one of it is to do with pay, but also it's to do with the recruitment processes of a lot of parties. William Rang is 36. Yeah. He's basically spent... He, he, got, he became a councillor, a local councillor in 2011. Mm. Before that, he was a primary school teacher for a couple of years. He doesn't really have any real-life experience. He spent, he spent his 20s right. in politics. So he's, he's not the kind of person that ideally should be in politics. He has no life experience. He's deputy chairman of the Conservative exactly. Party. And this I'm, is the problem. You know, I would argue, and I'm really passionate about this, and I think, again, the pay is one reason because yeah. you're not going to get the top, a top-ranking doctor or a top-ranking um, lawyer or head teacher People to like, with leave life their role and come and do this mm. job. And the second reason is we give politicians a hard time, and rightly so, because we expect more. But this conversation here, I would never do it. You couldn't pay well, me enough money. We don't money give them more, but because, we expect so much. Because I just could not handle the public pressure. It is, I think it is astounding how, how high it is. Because we expect more, we expect so much. I will let you come in, because I know, Laura, you've probably got a lot to say on this. Um, <laughs> but I think sometimes... It's a hard job, public, but there are lots the of hard jobs. Like but there are lots of hard jobs with a lot of pressure. Like you, you need to... Yes, just, I just, it's not, I, don't, I, I, I totally sympathise with your point of view that you wouldn't want to do it because of the public pressure, but it's just not an excuse. Mm. Integrity isn't it's the not, biggest... It's, it's not, not the biggest no, ask. Course, Integrity no. isn't the biggest ask. I mean, for example, the fact I, I, that... I do want to say something about William Rag, though. I don't think... OK, so he's um, he's made some terrible mistakes, but I think we need to be really careful to divide the fact that he's gay. It was on Grinder with what he's done, yeah. because I really think it would be unfortunate to conflate those two things. Just and he's I, just I don't care that he's, he's gay. Just, I don't no, give a monkey. I know. It makes no I'm difference. not saying you do, yeah. but it's, it's just coming up quite a lot in a way that sounds a little bit prejudicial. Well, the thing is, he's, he's, he's been quite vocal about the fact that he struggled with mental health issues. He feels like he's dedicated most of his 20s to politics and he's never really been able to live. So I, 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 get, I get, get that, but I think the wider conversation is, why aren't we recruiting a better calibre of politician? We don't give them enough. We don't pay them enough. We That's don't give them the prestige. Absolute rubbish. No, but it's true. You paid a fortune, one. That's not than, a fortune. Yeah, Eighty-three thousand. The average salary in this country is thirty. Yeah, but you're because we're a low wage economy. Hang on, there are an awful lot of people listening to this and watching this who will never dream of making ninety-one thousand pounds. Never mind the expenses they get on the top, which can be as much as half a million quid. No, I think that's on unfair. How far you go. Expenses not do not unfair. go. I work for an MP. They don't go for the MP's life. No, but they can go to their wife. They can go to one member no, of their they family. Don't. Yes, they, they can. Don't. For they, yes, stuff they that's can. for their work. Yes, no, I know, but you can employ businesses. your wife, you can employ you members can't of your family. That's, 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 that's you can. That's frowned upon. Yes, you can. You that's can employ them. Actually you can. The Listen, now. I've done stories on this for years and years and years and yes, years. Yes, until point recently. Is, uh, yeah, until recently, you, you could do anything. Anymore. You could still do it. You just have to go through a few more hoops. There are plenty of people who still employ members of their family, and who? you know they do. The <laughs> point about it is also that you can have a second home, you can furnish it, you can put televisions into it, you can, you can charge for this... I, I bought a pencil today. You know, it's an unreal world that they live no, in. It's I'm not sorry. right to no, say they don't make I don't any money. Think they do furnish. Do you know how much the Singaporeans pay their politicians? I don't care like, how much the Singaporeans pay. No, but a pay million dollars. And you know the reason why? The, the motivation is they get they stay in their job longer I because they're paid enough. They're, 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 they don't have the influence of lobbyists that are basically they don't basically lobby on behalf of big businesses, for instance. They actually take their job seriously. There's a case to be made that we don't pay our politicians enough. That's why we don't attract I don't politics. Agree. You wouldn't... You, would, if, would you be OK if your eye surgeon was paid five quid an hour? 
I wouldn't go to an eye surgeon that was paid five but, but why? Because you don't expect them to be good quality. Yeah, we expect, we expect the people eye. making policy on behalf of 67 million people to, to, no, to, to live I on know that I kind know of people money. Can, will only ever dream of that type of money. Trust me, I grew up in extreme poverty. Like, I understand right. that. So but I'll it's never do it. nonsense to say that they well, make well, too well, much well, money. But, but, then because, because the thing is, there's a responsibility of the role they have. But why is that? I think you've been a little bit misleading about the expenses there. No, I haven't. We can check them. We can check some expenses. And also, right. Next so time you come back in, costs, like I've, staffing, yeah, I know my wages. Yes, I know that. And I, I and wasn't. But, but there are, I'm there not going to buy MPs. my own pens. No one else. There are London to MPs. Let me tell you, stuff. there are London MPs who charge to get from where they live to the House of Commons. You think that's fair? Well, I don't. No, I don't. They're not meant to be doing well, that. Well, they you do. Should pull, you should name them I do. tonight. You and should I have. name them. And I have, and I've done it before. I think it's I ridiculous. I do it all the I time. It's a bugbear of mine. Not do you know, the fact, the fact that everyone's talking only about money is part of the problem here. It is a good salary. Some of them well, are there to... Good. Hang on, no. let me finish. It's not some, competitive. Some of, them, some of them are there to feather their nest. You know, you look at the jobs they go on to, lobbying, lots of that's where the real money cronies. Is. Yeah. It should be about public service, yeah. OK? And you do that if you believe in service and you believe in the public. And if you don't, then you don't have then integrity. Don't do it. And exactly. we have a lot of them there who don't have integrity. They're missing those core values. It's not just in politicians. We're seeing it throughout the civil service. We're, th we're yeah, seeing it absolutely. throughout society. Yeah. It's a problem with where we are the right now. The public sector I believe is a, a massive story... drain on the private people of this country who are the ones that pay tax, who pay for all of it. But I'm being told I'm in trouble now because we've been talking for too long about something. <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't involve Angela Rayner, who's still in trouble, by the way. Yeah. Don't think we're letting her off the hook. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up after the breaks, medical bonanza. Can the NHS escape it? It's addiction to foreign workers. Plus, Brits with pets are offered discounted butt lifts by touring Turkish surgeons. Sounds like a riddle. Stay tuned. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an Eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. The 
Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. The average salary of a migrant entering the UK with a visa dropped by nearly £10,000 in just two years to £32,946. And the driver is our addiction to foreign social care workers. This is despite the salary threshold for the new arrivals being raised to £38,750 last week because social care workers are apparently exempt from this rule. Will this nation ever get a grip on immigration? I don't think it will. This is only a small portion, of course, of it, because we also know that an awful lot of people come into this country to work inside the NHS as well. We've got a few NHS stories to talk about. Uh, so who better uh, to raise it all with uh, than NHS GP Dr Dean Eggett? Dr Dean, a very good uh, evening to you. Welcome back to the Independent Republic. Thank you, Mike. Nice to be back. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, I mean, social care is such a big uh, sort of area that I don't know where to begin, really. But certainly bringing in people from abroad to work in it is not only sort of necessary, it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary, isn't it? Because without them, there literally wouldn't be anybody in this country willing to do those jobs. You're absolutely right. Social care is the Cinderella topic in the NHS and, and healthcare in the UK. We don't talk about it anywhere near enough, but when we talk about solving the NHS problems, we need to also talk about solving social care problems. Yeah. Because half of the issue is that when people get sick and they finished in hospital, there's nowhere to go. Many patients can't return home and they need decent care and we just don't have enough people to care for patients. Right. And is that because the social care business itself is very badly organised? Because it seems to me that, you know, there's an awful lot of people at the top of it making a great deal of money running, you know, social care housing, running, um, you know, retirement homes, running care homes. Um, but right in the middle uh, are the patients who are paying through the nose, sometimes having to lose their house at the end of their life um, to pay for it. Um, and meanwhile, the people looking after them are paid pretty much a pittance. There is an argument that a lot of money goes into the businesses that run uh, social care, but doesn't go to the carers. We know very well that carers um, often work ridiculously long hours in doing jobs that many people wouldn't choose to do for an extremely low income that many people, quite frankly, just wouldn't get out of bed for. So it's hard to recruit to, it's hard to keep staff in, and um, yet it's ridiculously expensive. So the question has to be asked, where is that money going to? It's going on bricks and mortar, certainly. It's going on some infrastructure, but it's not going into paying carers for their wages and their hard effort. So where is it going? Um, I'd love to know the answer to that and question myself. And who determines exactly how much it costs for an individual to be looked after? Because it doesn't vary that much between various different councils. I mean, local councils will always say they can't afford social care and they haven't got enough money. But who decides how much it actually costs to pay for an individual's care? Is it worked out on an annual basis? Is it worked out on a monthly basis? How's it worked out? So there is a budget that uh, health care, or should I say care, is given to pay for individuals. And that's usually um, balanced out depending upon a, a weekly rate, a monthly rate, a yearly rate. Yeah. Um, and then some patients will have to pay for that themselves. Depending upon the home that you choose to go to depends upon that bill. So I can't give you a straightforward answer here. Um, but needless to say, if you don't have a great deal of cash to spend, um, the government is not going to give you a huge amount of money to spend on the most brilliant care home. So the more money you have got personally, the better care home you're going to get and the more expense you're going to have to spend on it, which might mean liquidating your assets, selling your house if you've got it to sell so that you can get the best care yeah. possible. The standard level of care available in England um, isn't brilliant. No, and that is the problem, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, um, I've always said, and many people have said, that there should be, the Labour Party is starting to talk about doing a kind of, you know, um, a complete and utter rehash of the system. But, I mean, that could take years, because everything in this country always takes years. It just seems to me that um, if you're a member of what used to be called the sandwich generation, where you've got your own kids, but you're also worried about where your parents are going to end up, you know, um, it's a very unfair system as well, it seems to me. Yeah, it's a pretty terrible system at the moment. And most people, I suspect, fear getting old. Certainly I do, because I do wonder, it's first of all, I can um, tell you. If, there's, <laughs> if there's going to be enough money <laughs> in the pot to pay for my care, or if I'm going to have enough money to pay for any decent level of care. And even if I have got money, are there going to be carers around to, to look after me? So there is this urgency in the here and now, first of all, for staffing, but secondly, for people to have some finances to pay for an upgrade to care, because the basic level of care that they get um, is quite frankly, in many cases, is, is not quality that any of us would choose. No, sure. And I mean, NHS uh, reform is now uh, 
clearly on the agenda for the Labour Party as well. West Streeting today was saying um, that you're going to have to look at, amongst other things, handing over some NHS work to the private sector. Now, they already do that quite in quite a, a strong way, don't they? It's quite a lot of people are sent to private uh, hospitals and sent to private clinics by the NHS, funded and paid for by the NHS, because the NHS doesn't have the bandwidth to cope with it. So the Labour Party is now clearly at least admitting for the first time that the NHS is not exactly the golden child. Yeah, and that's a really interesting topic, but I think it's a bit of a distraction from the real problem here. So first of all, West Streeting has got himself in trouble, I think, by being in Labour and saying, let's use some private health care, because it's not a typical Labour statement. But it's not a new statement either. That's exactly what the Conservative government is doing at the moment. And if you look at NHS England, what they've decided to do this year, they've made it very clear and say, we're actually going to use more private capacity. We are actively choosing to spend NHS cash on paying for patients to be seen in private hospitals to get rid of some of the waiting lists. Uh, now, some people think that's a brilliant idea. Some people think that's a terrible idea because more money should be spent in the NHS. But the reality is, again, we don't have the capacity here and now. There's not huge capacity in the private system either, but there's literally no capacity in the NHS. So patients have got to go somewhere somehow. And in some cases, patients are going abroad and being sent abroad for care because it's just we don't have the capacity right. here in the UK. Yeah, but how is it possible that the NHS has got the most employees it's ever had, which are now over two million, uh, which is one third now of all public sector workers? It's getting more money than it's ever been given. How is it worse than it ever was? Uh, that's a great question. I'd like to say it's because we're successful. I mean, it sounds really silly, doesn't it? That, you know, how, how can what you just... What you've, what you've just described be also described as successful. Well, it's successful because people are living longer. People are living into an age that we just didn't expect them to live to. And of course, that comes with more care needs that we just talked about, more medicines that we just talked about, more visits to the hospital, more operations. So naturally, if the NHS is successful in keeping people around for longer, you're going to have to spend more on them for longer periods of time to keep them fit and able members of the community or pay for care when they're not fit and able. That means more workforce. That means more expenditure. You know, the NHS, when it was invented, it was designed to make everyone fit and healthy and go to work. And they thought we would end up disbanding the NHS because everyone would be fit and well. But actually, the opposite has happened. We've kept people alive for longer but we haven't necessarily maintained fitness people aren't necessarily staying in work for longer we're just having to look after them for longer yeah well people are also much lazier than they used to be as well we've got six million people you said earlier don't want to get out of bed to go work in a care home they don't want to get out of bed for any job because they're getting paid so many benefits and they're more likely to get more money if they don't actually work and the problem is it's not the nhs that's that's been so successful it's just you know, modernity, isn't it? I mean, you know, everybody around the world is living longer. You can't credit the NHS for people living longer in Portugal, living longer in Germany, living longer in India. You know, it's got nothing to do with the NHS. It's got to do with modern society. And we don't any longer die of diseases which we've more or less eradicated. That's probably down to science, isn't it? You can't really lay claim to that from the NHS point of view. And there's an awful lot of problems because you can't get a, a, a GP's appointment in a lot of uh, places. I, uh, in, in South East London, where I look today, uh, there's a good 10% of people who are still waiting over a month to see a GP. There's 150,000 people um, who are lining up who can't get into an A&E. There's, you know, waiting lists that are, that are going on for years and years and years. So, I mean, you've also got 50% of people in, in the NHS who work for the NHS who don't do medical jobs. Yeah, it's fascinating. Actually, you talk about the welfare state as well. And actually, the NHS came out of the concept of describing the welfare state. This guy, Sir William Beveridge, came up with the concept of trying to get rid of a lot, a lot of the illness and, and poverty and, and, and stagnation of people um, back in the, the, the UK, back when the NHS was invented. And that's when the welfare state was also invented. And the welfare state was there to keep people in food, in shelter, in warmth, so they were fit and healthy and could go out and work was the key right. point. So when all of this was invented, it was about economic growth. It was about keeping people fit, healthy and working. And actually very much the opposite has happened. It has given people the opportunity to come back from work, to not necessarily engage in work and to be looked after. So the welfare state is a success in terms of looking after people, but it's not a success in terms of economic growth. Now, coming back to the NHS point that I made, you know, the success of the NHS... Put this to you, though, as a, but, as a, but as a doctor, though, Dean, you must also see the bad sides of, of the welfare state, which is that if you encourage people to not work, if you encourage people to um, have a life of leisure, it's actually not good for them. It's not good for them physically, it's not good for them mentally, and so it creates even more problems for the NHS. 
You're quite right. And that's where I think we do need to discuss reform of the NHS and the welfare state, because it's not working out the way we expected it to. And I've lost count of the number of times when I've had to have a chat to a patient and say, look, if I sign you off sick long term on say that you're housebound, your health is going to deteriorate. Yeah. You need to be active. You need to engage with people if your physical and mental health is going to improve. Now, that doesn't apply to everyone who mm. needs time away from work, but there's certainly a cohort of people who do need encouragement to be active in life again. And we're not helping those people right now with our welfare state. No, I get that. Dr. Dean Egan, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you again soon. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up, millions gather to watch a once-in-a-lifetime solar eclipse. We'll bring you the celestial spectacle after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. A total solar eclipse had millions of people across a heavily populated swathe of North America gazing towards the heavens today uh, as the moon completely blocked out the sun for more than four minutes. In some places, millions of Canadians living in the eastern part of the nation witnessed the once-in-a-lifetime event. No previous eclipse has covered such a large number of people. Let's go and see what's going on. Simon Calder is with us. He's in Montreal. He's going to tell us all about it. Simon, a very, very good evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, I've seen amazing pictures of you with incredible glasses on. I see you've taken them off now, so what's going on? Well, yes, we have seen the total eclipse, the great American eclipse of 2024 is now over, but it's been one heck of a party. Um, I can't tell you, there's 200,000 people or so, so gathered here 
saw about night suddenly descend on one of the greatest cities in the world. There were screams, there were shrieks, there were people who realized this was the most cosmic moment that any of them had, had seen. Yes, look at that. You can see suddenly night descending. And it is an absolutely entrancing 90 seconds or so. And then suddenly a little diamond of light, of light tops out from behind uh, the moon. And then you are back to, well, um, partial sunlight. I mean, if you can look up and see the sun, um, that's actually only about maybe... 10% of what you would normally expect. It's not a, 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 a full sun, and it's flipping freezing here. Yes, that's very interesting, isn't it? And also, there's a bit of interference on the line, which I presume is something to do with, you know, ion storms and that's solar right. flares that and all sorts were, of other stuff happening. Right. Yeah. But, we just have a little trouble, Simon. Always, having a, always a, remember. There, there, we're having a little trouble with your signal there, which I presume is interference, as I say, from uh, from the solar eclipse. But you're looking at it there. Uh, we saw it earlier on on James Max's show uh, when it started happening in Mexico, uh, and it looked absolutely incredible. As I said, nobody made the joke about a corona from Mexico earlier, so I'll do it. Um, Simon, I think we've got you back. Um, did you sense any kind of feeling of awe, Simon? Because I know that you've chased these things around the globe a few times. I remember the one back in 1999 in Cornwall. Um, but according to sort of folklore, yes. a lot of people believe that this is uh, an omen which is not necessarily good, that it could be a great evil will follow. And, I mean, you and I both know that um, Tony Blair was in government last time this happened, and, I mean, it was, wasn't great, but it wasn't really... A, I wouldn't call it a great evil. No, it, it's... Well, yeah, there, there are people. I've spoken to a few people. I've been in town for only uh, about 18 hours now, talking to people, though, some of them said, I'm not going to watch that. They genuinely thought that it was some, some kind of cosmological magic that was going to um, uh, uh, cause them problems. But honestly, you've been to Canada, Mike. It's as friendly as the Independent Republic, Republic of Mike Graham. So everybody's in really... Uh, there's been a party atmosphere. They laid on this huge, huge, huge arena in the Parc Jean of Drapeau and... Oh, everybody seems to be having the time of their life, and quite right too. Um, they call it the eclipse of the century here because, well, they won't be seeing another one this, this side of 2099. But if you want to see one, Mike, then all you've got to do is get yourself to the beautiful uh, Spanish island of Mallorca on the 12th of August 2026, when you're going to see a spectacular uh, eclipse. And, of course, the weather prospects are pretty good for that part of Spain mm. at that time of year. Absolute peak season. So who knows what the crowds are going to be like there. But Montreal, the one really big city where actually the eclipse was seen through clear skies. Magical event. I just wish you were here, Mike. And so does everybody else. Well, listen, I was in New York uh, last week and just after I left, I had an earthquake. So, I mean, I'm not quite sure whether um, yeah. uh, being in, 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 in place for the, for the <laughs> eclipse would be good. But what about back here in Old Blighty? Because we were told that some people up in the north of Scotland and possibly from Glasgow north would be able to see something. But, but I think it's a bit overcast. Yeah. Well, yeah, but look, if you're high up and if you're lucky with cloud cover, um, this eclipse, which has just left me, is travelling at 1,500 miles an hour towards you. It's slightly going to run out of steam over the Atlantic, um, just short of, the, uh, of, of, of Ireland. But you will, if you're around about 7.55 p.m., um, if you're lucky enough to have a clear view to the west and there isn't any clear co cloud cover, you should be able to see it quite close to uh, sunset. Um, you need to take great precautions, of course, and you need special eclipse glasses. Although I dare say, if it's a really, uh, if you're so close to sunset, you may be able safely to do that, but please take advice before you do it. Um, and yeah, we haven't got any more eclipses um, to the UK until I think 2090. 
Um, yeah. I'm already planning my trip then, and um, I hope you are as well, Mike. <laughs> yeah, so shortly after I uh, opened my account with the Cryogenics Institute uh, in Michigan. Um, <laughs> what about if you're on a plane right now flying across the Atlantic? Yeah. Would you be able to see something from that? Well, that is the, the great mystery. I talked to a couple of the airlines, and um, they say, yeah, actually, if you're flying from London Heathrow, uh, maybe towards um, Boston, to Toronto, to New York, yeah. it may well be that, actually, it may well be that, the, um, uh, that you would be able to see some of the uh, uh, total eclipse but they didn't want to make any promises because, well, they simply never know whether it's... Uh, whether winds or whatever might make it impossible. But uh, generally, yes, a, a wonderful opportunity. And of course, I very much hope there will be pilots up there who will be taking pictures from the flight deck. Uh, yes. There's also a couple of US fighter jets which have been chasing at twice the speed of sound um, to get some great scientific data on, on the uh, solar eclipse. So, uh, yes, an awful lot to be said for it. I hope this excites people and get some interesting phenomena coming down the track, including the Northern Lights this winter, which are going to be as good as they've been. Yeah, well, in talking of the Northern Lights, I can tell you that in Norse culture, um, the gods um, make, make uh, total eclipses into something evil because they believe that uh, that Loki um, is uh, somehow got revenge on those who try to put him into chains, right? Um, and that's what caused the eclipse. If you're in Colombia, people shout to the heavens because they believe the eclipse will make them work harder. That's one for you, obviously. Um, um, making uh, making work harder. And also, if you're um, in, in other parts of Europe, if your child is born during the eclipse, you believe that the child will be born with superpowers. Fantastic. Were you born during an eclipse, Mike? I must have been. That's the only I mean, thing I can imagine. Must have been. Yeah. You know, can't imagine. I can't well, imagine. Yes. I wasn't. But a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of all the humans who've ever lived has seen a total eclipse. And we are living at a time when, thanks to the wonders of air travel, actually more and more people are empowered to do this. I tell you who I feel really sorry for, and that's all the people who were looking at the weather charts over the past... Um, decades and thinking, right, Texas is the place to be. It's been pretty miserable there, I understand. And very, very unfortunate. And, um, well, yes, those of us who were travelling out on the Eclipse Express, the British Airways flight last night, I grabbed the last, last seat on it, and I'm so glad I did, because yeah. uh, this was a magical experience. Brilliant. Well, great to see you, Simon. Thank you very much for uh, filling us in and informing us there. And you've got loads of time now to enjoy the rest of the afternoon and the evening in Montreal, which is no bad thing at all. Uh, Simon Calder there. The idea that the eclipse is a bad omen, apparently supported by NASA, by the way, they say uh, there are upcoming issues that people still believe will cause bad health and bad fortune if you see an eclipse. Uh, pregnant women are warned not to look up. Some of them are warned, are warned that they should wear red. There's some amazing stories and superstitions around these things, which we may uh, invade and look into a little bit later on. But you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, less celestial matters. Draconian councils have found another way to steal yet more cash from your wallets. Don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
and I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, it was, it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for Taking the Mic. Now there well may be there may well be a total eclipse of the sun tonight, as you've seen, but it feels more and more like we are living in an increasingly mad world where there has been a total eclipse of common sense. Never mind the madness of the Middle East, don't mention the craziness of what's happening north of the border and disregard the nonsense of the Westminster bubble. This country is drowning in a sea of red tape and most of it is wrapped around driving a car by our local councils. We are constantly hearing about how cash-strapped our local authorities are, how they have been hopelessly incapable of making ends meet, how some of them have already been forced to enter bankruptcy and how many others will follow. They complain. They don't have enough money to pay for social care. They say they have no money for education and that they don't have any other choice than to raise your council tax to simply stay afloat economically. What they never mention, though, is the true cost of all the salaries they're paying, all the pensions they're funding for those employees, and the vast sums of money they are adding to the bill in the name of diversity and inclusion. You will not be surprised to learn that all of that costs an awful lot of money. But wait, what's that on the horizon? Could it be a cash cow coming over the hill? That's right, it's the good old beleaguered car driver. And if you're one of them, you will know that it's getting harder and harder to keep your car on the road without paying hundreds of extra pounds per year for it. Whether it's low emission zones, congestion charges, parking charges, parking fines, or more road tax, more and more people are finding it harder and harder to keep their cars on the road. Now it appears that we have been right all along in the independent republic, but that will come as no surprise. Figures released this week show that motorists are already paying £2 billion a year to park their cars in council-run spaces, and those charges are set to rise yet again. The figures come from the Department of Leveling Up for 2023, which show a rise in over £200,000 from the previous year. And it gets worse. Many councils are going to put their fees up by 60% for this year, and they're going to force drivers to download apps to pay for them rather than having pay and display bays which are favoured by older car owners. In London, there's already a consultation underway to increase parking penalty fines from £160 to God knows what. Apparently, that's not enough to dissuade people from driving. Well, guess what? There's a reason people keep driving in. It's because they have to. Today, there was yet another train strike, which meant commuters had either no choice but to get a car or stay home. I've just got one question. What the hell are they doing with all that money?
Absolutely extraordinary times. Councils are raking in an unbelievable two billion quid in parking charges. That's up more than £20 million uh, on the year before. And this news comes, of course, in the month that local authorities are about to increase parking charges by as much as 60%, which seems to me completely and utterly untenable. If you live in any part of this country, you'll know that you're now paying for something that used to be free. Joining me now is former Top Gear presenter, Mr Steve Berry. Steve, welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. How are you doing? Not so bad, Mike. I think I've just realised why that thing that you press in the middle of the steering wheel is called a horn. <laughs> it's because we are cash cows. Yes. I'm surprised they don't make a mooing sound. <laughs> we pay the duty on fuel at source when we buy it before we use it. Yeah. We pay the road tax before we use it. And we pay to park at the t before we do it. Mm. Think of any other way that these councils have got of raising money. There's no other way like that. Right. Where you get all the money up front and you get it instantly and you get it every single day. And yet, if you go to any the town centres around my part of the world, if you go to those big old industrial, post-industrial towns like Bolton and Stockport and Bury and Rochdale and Oldham, the town centres are dead. There's tumbleweed up blowing down Bradshaw yeah. and Bolton. And if they want folks to come into the town, the last thing they need to do is to be putting the parking charges up yet again. Yes. 60% in one go. Because people have just stopped coming. That's it. They've stopped coming anyway because it's only charity shops and pound shops around yeah. our way. And now they're going to be even less inclined to visit a town centre. Yeah. But that's exactly the point. One of the reasons that there's only charity shops and, and uh, you know, uh, betting shops and all that sort of thing is because the rates that the councils are charging people to have a shop in the town centre have become so ridiculous and the fact that nobody can park means that there's no customers, it's not worth doing it. Because I was looking at some of the comments um, today that people were making, because I've been talking about, I talk about this a lot, as you know, um, and people were telling me that there's a Trafford centre there where it doesn't cost you anything to park, so people will go and park there, go and do all their shopping there, and I saw some who said, you know, why would I want to pay five quid to go and park to pick up a few vegetables and, and, and some bags of tea? You know, people just won't do it. Exactly. So all this talk about revitaling town centres and repurposing these rows and rows of empty shops all boarded up and covered in graffiti is nonsense. Never mind putting the parking charges up. Take them away completely. Offer people free parking. Yeah. That's what the commercial sector does. That's what all these out-of-town shopping centres have been doing for the last 30 years. I remember when the first one in the UK opened, I think it was the Meadow Hall at Sheffield. Right. And we all went down there and we were looking. I remember looking round for the parking meter to pay. They said, no, it's free. Yeah. And I thought, well, yeah, because they want to attract people that would normally go into Sheffield. So if they offer free parking, that will bring people. I'm from Bury, one of the biggest market towns in this country. Yeah. And one of the biggest attractions of Bury's world-famous market was that it's free parking. Yeah. Well, not anymore. And not only is it not free parking, they've hugely reduced the amount of parking that there is in the right. town. Councils just see the motorist as a cash cow and they turn to the motorist first every time right. because we're a soft touch. Exactly. Well, these figures have come out, interestingly enough, this time, Steve, from the Department for Leveling Up because they're going to do a study now into whether all of this sort of blanket, um, you know, fining of people parking and charging of people parking is actually damaging town centres. Well, they don't need to do a study because, as you say, you could already tell them the answer to that. They don't need to spend any time looking into it because we can tell them the truth. I've just come back from the States, right? I was in America. Um, I was in Connecticut where my sister lives. Beautiful little town in, uh, in sort of, uh, in the middle of Connecticut. You can park anywhere you like and it doesn't cost you any money, ever. You know, obviously the cities are different, but in that town, there is not one boarded up shop. There is not one, um, you know, uh, charity shop. It's a booming economy because people can go and shop and park their cars without being fined for it. Yeah, my missus is in California as we speak, looking at that eclipse. And, uh, you know, where she is, about just outside Los Angeles, and I'm sure throughout California and particularly North America, there are all sorts of rules about people operating businesses and the amount of parking spaces that they're obliged to yes. offer to their customers. Not in Manchester. Come to Manchester, Mike. 
were putting up a forest of skyscrapers and expecting to fill them up with uh, young, thrusting, 20-something couples, but no room for the cars. No. no well, they do, no. They've, done, they've, they've been doing that. They've been doing that down here for ages. They were putting up, you know, oh, yeah, we need new blocks of flats, but the blocks of flats don't come with any parking space at all. And so if you have got a car, you've got to take your chances. Where I live, in my street in London, when I moved in there sort of 10 years ago or so, um, street parking was free. Now you've got to pay to get a residential permit to park there. Do you know what, Mike? I was going into the city as well today and looking, and I don't know if the rest of the country knows this, and I hate to go on about it, but I'm going to because it's my experience. Manchester's un undergoing at the moment an unprecedented building boom. There isn't another city in all of Europe that is putting up as many skyscrapers as Manchester. And yet the road that I was driving me on took me back 10 years to a rally that I did in the Sahara Desert. <laughs> and I had to go on something called something called the Spanish Road right. in Mauritania. Now, this road in Mauritania had an excuse. It had been heavily mined. The one in Manchester <laughs> is just suffered from the horrific neglect of Manchester City Council. Yes. And when I, when I drove down that road last week, I heard a clanking noise, and I went to see my pal Graham. He took the back wheel off my Jag. The shock absorber had punched its way up through the body of the car. Goodness. That's how bad the potholes have got. And if anybody thinks I was speeding through city centre Manchester, just try that, because if you can manage to exceed the speed limit, you're a better man than me. Yeah, well, absolutely right. I mean, the average speed in London now is something like eight and nine miles an hour. If you get over 10, you're doing well. The other problem, I think, for people who try to park their cars in this country is a lot of older people as well, quite, well, you know, they understand there's no more parking meters and no more cash, but they quite like a pay and display. A lot of these city centre car parks now, they're saying, you've got to get an app. If you haven't got an app, then that's no good to anybody. And, of course, they haven't got apps because a lot of them are not too familiar with how to do that. Yeah, and I got caught out with one of those recently, and it was in a situation where I'd paid what I think is big money to go and see a gig, you know, right. like we used to back in the day when... Uh, when those of us used to go out and watch live people actually <laughs> doing something live in front of us. And I get to Without the venue, filming it on a phone, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. And um, I get to the venue and I'm trying to park and the bloke said, oh, you've got to download the app. I don't want to download the app. I've got enough bloody apps on my phone as it is. <laughs> I've got to get... I said, can I not just pay in a machine with my yeah. card or with cash? No, mate, you've got to download the app. Yeah. So because I paid for... I think I paid for all four tickets, to be honest with you, although I was getting it in cash back, I'm sure. Because I paid and everybody else is there, you're in that situation, you find yourself a lot of the time now. They've got you over a barrel. Yeah. There was nothing I could do. I had to download the app and I had to go through, fill it all in, and then guess what? I'm now getting bombarded for with sure. daily emails from that company. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. But you know it's going to happen, don't you? You do. It's an absolute nightmare. Oh, Listen, Steve, good to see Facebook. you. No. Good to see. You. I've got to go off. Go, calm, go and have a lie down. Calm yourself down. Um, but don't calm yourself down for the next hour, though, because you're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. After the break, David Cameron's going to go to Washington with cap in hand for some aid for Ukraine. See you after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eave it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We're with talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, uh, set to throw down his gauntlet in Washington, it's David Cameron, who's hell-bent on sparring US Republicans for more Ukraine funding. And also, hate crime hysteria. Scottish football fans face complaints from members of the public who've heard chants on the television at home, folks. Plus, electric explosion, four people narrowly escape injury after an e-bike explodes at a London station. Ban the darn things already, for heaven's sake. Now, it's a hard life in the NHS. It must be, because that's all we ever hear about. How poor junior doctors are, how badly treated the nurses are, and how much more money is required to make it all work better. And if you listen to Sir Keir Starmer, it's all the fault of those horrible Tories. Well, I've got some bad news for you. Quite a lot of doctors are doing rather well, thank you very much. Plenty of nurses are also able to take advantage of some very generous overtime rates. And most of them didn't actually go on strike. Plus, the NHS has never been in receipt of more money from any government ever in its entire history. But they don't want to tell you that. Oh, no. They want you to think the NHS is on its last legs. They don't want you to see what's really going on behind the curtain. Because it ain't pretty, ladies and gentlemen. Very few people now think the NHS is doing a good job. Faith in the organisation itself is at an all-time low. And most people's expectations of what their NHS experience will be have never been worse. Nevertheless, junior doctors are still looking for a 35% pay rise. Consultants were on strike for almost a year before they secured another £20,000 a year for their already bulging wallets. And if you're a GP, you're not looking out for any Red Cross parcels coming your way anytime soon. Figures published last year show that average GP income before tax in England was running at £118,000. That's up from 95,700 a decade ago, which is an increase of about 23%. Quite a nice little earner. And in a few cases, it gets even more extraordinary. The NHS was forced to admit this week that at least four GPs were paid more than £1 million a year during COVID, and several more were making in excess of 800,000. That'll be helped by all that extra money they got for giving out COVID vaccines. I'd like to tell you a bit more about the true figures, but I'm afraid the NHS isn't going to tell us despite ever more promises of transparency and value for money. Meanwhile, at the sharp end, where you are, it is still very difficult for patients to actually get some face time in front of an NHS GP. In South East London, for example, nearly 31% of patients still have to wait between two and seven days for an appointment, 13% can wait up to two weeks, and more than 10% are waiting for over a month. It's not exactly value for money, is it? Unless, of course, you're a doctor. 
Now, later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Metro front page for you uh, and a slightly disturbing story about our food. The headline says, Forever Toxins in Our Fruit and Veg. And what it basically says is that toxins that take centuries to break down have been found in fruit, vegetables and spices, which are on sale in British stores. Um, these things are apparently known as forever chemicals. So if you thought eating strawberries was a good idea, or grapes, or spinach, or tomatoes, or peaches, or cucumbers, or apricots, I'm afraid we've got some bad news for you. You're consuming a load of toxins, which apparently can cause cancer. So I dare say the vegan brigade will say, oh, it's all to do with what they're spraying on them. Well, it might be. But what I'm saying is if you think you're eating a, a diet which is rich in fruit and vegetables, um, you could actually be doing yourself rather a lot of harm. So we'll check that out. Plus all the other big stories in the papers coming up a little bit later on. Um, but let's talk about what's happening uh, in the war zone because blocking aid to Ukraine puts the West at risk. That's the message that David Cameron will push to Republicans ahead of his upcoming visit to Washington, D.C. In a face-to-face -face meeting, the Foreign Secretary will urge House of Representatives Speaker Mike Johnson to bring an end to his Republican colleagues' opposition to the aid. Republican opponents in the House of Representatives, of course, who make up half of the US Congress, are currently blocking Joe Biden's $75 million bill, billion dollar bill, I should say, which contains aid for Ukraine. But of course, as I've said to many people before, there's quite a large chunk of people in the USA, and of course here as well, who don't actually want to give us any money for it anymore because, frankly, the money has been spent. Joining me now uh, is Fox News commentator Joe Concha. Joe, very good evening to you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. I mean, I had this Thanks, argument Mike. with somebody just recently, only last week. You know, there's a very big number of people in this country and in the US of A who think that we mm. cannot just continue to give hand over billions and billions of pounds in either money and cash or, or weapons to Ukraine in order to kind of continue a conflict which appears to be entering a kind of stalemate phase. Mike, that's the frustration because in the US we're talking well north of $100 billion that's already been given to Ukraine so they can protect their borders. Meanwhile, the US southern border uh, is wide open with terrorists coming through on a daily basis. So it seems like to many voters here in the US, the priorities are all out of whack. And we really don't know where this money is going. There is no accountability as far as, OK, we're giving you more than $100 billion. Is it really all going towards weapon, weapons and defense and to help feed soldiers? Or Ukraine, which has been an historically corrupt country, is something else happening here? And the frustration is that now that we're more than two years after this war began, it seems, you use the exact right word there, Mike, stalemate seems to be perpetual. In other words, the Russians and the Ukrainians are, are bogged down in the east. The Russians can't get to Kiev or any major city. And Ukraine can't push Russia out. So I have a feeling that we could be talking in the year 2029 about the seven year anniversary of the Russia Ukraine war where nothing has really right. changed. So I think people just want to hear okay, is there any negotiation? Is there any end game here? Are we just going to keep throwing money right. at the problem with no end game in sight? Well, that's the funny thing, isn't it? Because I mean, I was looking earlier on at a Tommy Lauren uh, a tweet, and she, of course, is a regular guest on this show. Uh, she says to, uh, she sends a message to, to, to Vladimir Zelensky saying, Sorry, pal, we've got our own invasion to worry about. Uh, go shake down the rest of Europe. Uh, which I take, I take it she means including uh, the UK in that. And this is what a lot of people feel like. They feel like, well, hang on a minute, you know, there is no plan here as such. And while we talk about making peace work in the Middle East and many people, including Joe Biden, say, well, it might involve Israel having to, you know, sit down with terrorists. Well, how about if you want peace in Ukraine? It might involve sitting down with the Russians and saying, well, maybe we'll give you a bit of the land um, and maybe we can end the war. Yeah, that, that that would be nice to hear, right? And and we keep hearing from Zelensky that no, we're not going to give you know even one percent of our land over right. to Russia. Okay, so then what's your plan if right. you can't get them out just to have more men dying? I mean, a whole generation of men have basically been lost in Ukraine, and Russia will just keep throwing bodies at the problem uh, until they finally can win that war. And then you hear the argument, Mike, that well, if we allow. Russia to take some parts of Ukraine now, they're going to march into Poland next towards Warsaw. Right. I'm sorry, the Russian military doesn't scare 
uh, me all that much anyway, because they look more like the Vermont National Guard. Right. I mean, they have old tanks and and they, they've lost, what, more than 500,000 soldiers. I don't think the appetite is there at all to start right. trying to take back Poland and Eastern Europe, because I don't think they have the capability, quite frankly. Mike. Well, exactly right. I mean, I had a conversation with Bill Browder um, late last month in which he was telling me all about how everything Putin says is for his own uh, national sort of, you know, domestic uh, audience and he says a great many things which he never intends to do uh, and when he said to me that you know if we don't stop him um he's going to go into poland next i said well how do you know that he said well because he said so i said well hang on a minute you just told me that everything he says is for domestic consumption you can't have it both ways right. browder of course hates the idea of donald trump getting in and actually said to me if donald trump gets elected we will have world war three i don't believe that either wow it, well Maybe if Trump were president before, we'd know exactly what the world would look like when he becomes president again if he wins in November. Oh, that's right. He was president before, <laughs> Mike, from 2017 to 2021. And at last check, I don't think Russia walked into Ukraine and invaded that country. And I'm pretty sure that ISIS uh, was a big, big problem under the Obama-Biden administration that Trump eviscerated. I'm pretty sure North Korea was doing daily tests of nuclear weapons over Japan, over Guam, threatening the United States until Trump said, you'll be met with a fire and fury right. the likes of which the world has never seen. And suddenly Kim Jong-un was behaving. And China certainly wasn't eyeing up Taiwan the way they are right. now as far as that aggressive posture. So yeah, under Trump, I'm pretty sure the world was infinitely more stable than it has been under Biden over these last three years. Exactly right. And David Cameron, or Lord Cameron, as he's now known, is coming over uh, shortly to meet up with uh, uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. I mean, um, what sort of uh, reception do you think he's going to get? I mean, in my personal view, it's not something he should be doing. Um, but will he receive a sort of warm welcome? Do people care what he thinks? Well, you know, he hasn't been truly relevant in some time, right? I mean, you would know this better <laughs> than I would. But does, uh, let me let me answer your question by asking you a question. Does he still have a lot of influence in British politics, or is he more just seen as a Bill Clinton type of? Hey, it was fun while it lasted. Well, he was. Well, the interesting thing about Cameron is that he was roundly blamed for causing the problems that we currently suffer um, in terms of illegal migrants coming from Libya, because he was the yeah. one that kind of spearheaded the attacks on Muammar Gaddafi, who might not have been everybody's favourite cup of tea, but Libya was a lot safer when he was running it. You know what I mean? Um, um, so Cameron had been out in the wilderness, he was writing books, he was counting his money, suddenly made an appearance in a cabinet reshuffle, but in order for him to do so, had to because he's not a sitting MP, he's not a politician anymore, he had to be made a, a lord, and so he was given access to the House of Lords, which is rather nice for him, and suddenly he was made foreign secretary. So he is, you know, he's our secretary of state, effectively. So he has influence inside Downey Street, but nobody in the country really takes him very seriously. Okay. Well, uh, he's meeting with Speaker Johnson. Speaker Johnson opposes aid going to Ukraine. He at least wants it tied into more border funds as far as wall construction or as far as reinstating remain in Mexico, obviously right. having more border patrol agents. Uh, and, and that's been the resistance of, of the Biden administration. It doesn't want any part of that. So uh, I, I guess we'll see uh, how it goes for Lord Cameron. I, I, how do I, I want that title. I mean, Lord, <laughs> that sounds pretty awesome. I mean, Lord Mike Graham, I can see yeah. that. I mean, I've always said I would turn it down. But, yeah, I mean, it certainly gets you into restaurants and, uh, you know, gets you upgraded at the hotel yeah. uh, that you check into. But, you know, here's the problem uh, when you take it back to, to Ukraine. Surely there must be people who think sensibly in this. You know, it might not be right that we give them no aid at all, but it can't be surely without any ties or without any kind of promises uh, to, 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 to at least try and find some kind of solution. Or if, let's say, the United States is offering $50 billion more in in help as far as aid, and uh, the UK is offering X billion in terms of pounds, then boy, Donald Trump's argument is, what's Germany ponying up again? And what are all these other NATO countries yeah. uh, doing? We keep hearing how great the organization is, but when it kind of comes time to put up or shut up, uh, they're not putting up very much. And the US has to carry a large majority of that burden. So you would hope there would be some common sense here. And we learned from the past, like Vietnam, that, hey, at some point, you got to cut your losses yeah. and at least try to save your country uh, from every man, woman, and child basically being forced to fight in this. But Zelensky doesn't seem to have any appetite for that. And the US media certainly seems to be cheering it on. That's the interesting yeah. part. That is the other interesting thing, isn't it? Let's go back to the Donald for a moment, because he had a big fundraiser recently in which he raised huge amounts of money, twice as much, I think, as Biden um, and his two uh, former presidential mates did in New York last week, as we discussed. Um, he's also uh, been making some rather off-colour remarks, you might say, about Joe Biden, uh, suggesting that he may have soiled himself um, uh, in the Oval Office. What's, what's been going on? 
Uh, well, that's Donald Trump being Donald Trump, and he knows that when he says something like that, that's going to draw some media attention right. and some outrage, obviously. That's obviously a play on the fact that Joe Biden is 81 years old and that 75, 80 percent of American voters do not think he should be president for another four years because he doesn't have the mental or physical acuity. So it's it's a play on that, I guess. If I were advising Trump, not that he probably listens to too many advisors uh, too often, I would say, look, just stick to inflation and crime and the border, immigration, foreign policy. Be happy, Trump. You could be strong, Trump, like in The Apprentice. Yeah. Uh, but th th the name calling around this and everything, I, I think, I don't know, just be above it because it's 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 a it's a distraction to, to a certain No, I think that would probably be what most people would say. He's also said it would be a great honour to go to jail for violating the gag order imposed by the judge in the Stormy Daniels case. I assume he's probably not going to do that either. Uh, well, no. I, look, he's begging to get arrested, basically, you know, right. and, and put in a jail cell for a night. When he, uh, there was a mugshot of him, I believe it was down in Atlanta, he proudly put it on his tro true social page, yeah. and it gets like a million likes. In other words, he wants to play the martyr here because, in essence, he's seen as one by almost all of his supporters, mm -hmm. particularly with the Stormy Daniels case, which statute of limitations and the fact that it's weak sauce as far as you speak to any sober and sane legal analyst here in the States, that this case shouldn't even be going to trial. So, I don't think it'll have any impact on him one way or another, even if he is found guilty, because people see this as election interference and weaponization right. of the U.S. justice. And no change, really, since we last spoke on the on the, um, uh, on, on the polls as such. I mean, Trump is still in a slight lead, isn't he? Uh, he is, but he's leading in the places that matter. So there was a poll out last week from the Wall Street Journal. Our elections come down to, we have 50 states here in the United States. It comes down to seven states. It, right. All the other ones basically go always blue or always red. So it comes down to North Carolina, and it comes down to Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. I could reel that off the top of my head because yeah. I've said this many times. And in that particular Wall Street Journal poll, Trump leads in six of those seven swing states and is tied in a seventh. And if you remember 2020 and 2016, Trump didn't lead in any polls right. leading up to his victory in 2016 and his very narrow loss in 2020. So if he's leading now in all the right places, uh, that tells you that Joe Biden is right now the odds-on favourite to not be a two-term president. Yeah, right. interesting. Joe Concha, good to talk to you again. Thank you very much indeed. Joe Concha reporting into us there from New York, of course, uh, for Fox News. Right now, though, confusion and controversy continues to surround Scotland's new hate crime law. Complaints made to the police every single minute. Officers, of course, now working overtime to deal with it all. Police Scotland has confirmed it has received complaints related to hate crime over the course of yesterday's old firm match between Rangers and Celtic. Fans were warned before the game they could face complaints from members of the public who heard offensive chants on television at home. Uh, we've now got a police officer with the Scottish Daily Mail, Mike Blackley. Uh, Mike, a very good evening to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us right here uh, on Talk TV. I mean, I sort of jokingly put out um, a reference after the game yesterday, you know, Rangers 3, Celtic 3, number of hate complaints filed, 1,578 know, or something like that. Because, I mean, it was obvious, wasn't it, that this was going to happen, that there would be complaints made because of what was chanted at the game, that there could be complaints made uh, almost every second of almost every day, which is proving to be the case. Um, I, re I read a column uh, today uh, in one of the Scottish newspapers, I think it was Ian McWhorter's column in the Herald, where he said, you know, this is quite frankly, the most ridiculous law that's ever been brought in, and it's kind of united everybody in Scotland against the SNP. Well, it, it has now. There's been quite an outcry about it, and you're, you're right to say that some of the concerns about the number of complaints were, were concerns that were aired in advance of this coming in, in as, as a, a law. It has to be said, though, it was in 2021, certainly the case that uh, a lot of the concerns that were raised were ignored by the vast majority of MSPs, not just from the SNB, but from Labour and the Liberal Democrats and the Greens as well. Uh, the Conservatives were the only party at the time that really stood against this. And it does seem like one of the, one of the uh, several situations that we've had at, at Holyrood where the Scottish Parliament doesn't really represent the, the views of the, the public as a whole because there were a, a lot of concerns about this legislation, but it easily went through in the Scottish Parliament. Yes, and it was backed significantly by, um, by Alice Anwar and, of course, um, uh, the Labour Party in Scotland, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, they more or less want the same laws in there. Yeah, the Scottish Labour leader, Anas Sarwar, has, has backed it throughout. It, 
it remains to be seen. There, there has been examples in the past. There was one piece of the legislation about offensive behaviour at football, which uh, likewise seemed to generate quite a lot of cross-party support. And then once it came in, uh, things changed. The, the public were against it, and some of the views of politicians changed as well. And that ended up being repealed. It remains to be seen whether the backlash about this is going to be strong enough to lead to the same sort of thing happening. But certainly we've been hearing from so many different groups, uh, whether it be uh, women's rights campaigners or whether it be police, police officers who are simply concerned about drowning in the number of complaints that that they've got, and that was one of the concerns about the old firm game. This was a this was a game that there were no away fans present, but yet Police Scotland confirmed there were a small number of complaints. So the only conclusion from that is surely that these complaints came from people who felt offended at something they had seen or heard while watching TV or radio. So uh, it, it is a pretty pretty bizarre situation. Yes. But, of course, you would know as well as I do that in old firm games, everybody knows the chants that are going to be sung. I mean, if you don't, if you don't want to hear the ones that, uh, that they chant at Rangers, you can hear the ones that they chant at Celtic, where, again, Rangers fans don't usually go. And both fans, or sets of fans, will be um, equally offended. But it seems to me as well that lots of people are making complaints just for the sake of it. 8,000, I think we're told, uh, have been made now so far. We made um, Humza Yusuf the plank of the week this week, um, on uh, Talk TV, because most of the complaints up until the old firm game were about him. Uh, yeah, I think uh, both Hamza Yusuf and J.K. Rowling were the uh, were dominating in terms of the the number of complaints. Uh, for Hamza Yusuf, it, it related to a speech that he pre previously made, uh, where he was raising concerns about the number of white people in all of the top posts in Scotland. Yeah. It has to be said that. The, the, the speech was slightly taken out of context by some people on online, and that's probably what, what sparked a lot of the, the complaints, people that had seen an uh, abbreviated version of the speech yeah. uh, online. However, it, it does just illustrate the problem entirely because uh, this, this is a, a law that is entirely about concerns about people stirring up hatred mm. and... It's it's not clear at all to the public or indeed it seems to police officers exactly what the criminal threshold for this this is. Right. So you've got that bombardment of complaints from people who simply don't seem to know whether uh, their cases pass that threshold or right. not. And meanwhile, the police are saying they're having to draft in more police officers and they're having to pay more police officers overtime to deal with all the complaints. And that's what I mean when I say uh, it's, it's a massive mess because we've also got Murdo Fraser, the Tory MSP, saying that, you know, the complaint that was put in about him was ruled not to breach the criminal threshold, but nevertheless, the police recorded it anyway as a non-crime hate incident. Which, the, which was then taken to um, the Scottish Parliament um, and the person who'd made the complaint, who happened to be a trans activist, said, well, look, the police have recorded it as a non-crime hate incident. What are you going to do now? So it's creating a kind of web of nonsense around these complaints, which may have no merit, but you still have to investigate. Yeah, and in that case with Murdo Fraser, he's actually considering the idea of legal action against the police because of the way that he's been treated. Yeah. And he's, he's certainly not been made uh, to feel any better by events of the last week because uh, it was confirmed that in the case of both Hamza Yusuf and J.K. Rowling, that they didn't get these non-criminal hate incidents logged on their criminal record, whereas Murdo Fraser, who didn't breach criminal threshold either, uh, did get that logged on his his criminal record. So there's big questions for uh, are Police Scotland handling this the same for everyone? Right. And uh, they they are they are facing these difficult questions. There there was also a pretty remarkable case uh, that emerged in in our paper today, where an uh, ex police officer had complained about a anti Semitic post, and one of the questions that she faced. Uh, when police were deciding whether to investigate, was whether she was Jewish herself, which right. shouldn't really have anything to, to do no. with the case itself. But she found her, herself being asked those questions. Right. And didn't the police then um, sort of decide to conclude that since she was not Jewish, it, she couldn't be offended? 
Um, well, they they didn't take it forward because uh. she wasn't Jewish, and and that that certainly seems to be against the spirit of the legislation. There's a there's a reasonable test. Uh, would, would a reasonable right. person think that this was stirring up hatred? Um, but I, I suppose what the, that case illustrates as well is just the the mass confusion about this. There's there's all these concerns about are is every case being dealt with the same way? Uh, is there a potential bias in the way that things are being dealt with? Do the police really understand the legislation? Um, and I think this this case illustrates all of those those problems with it. Yeah, absolutely extraordinary state of affairs. Mike, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Mike Blackley there, disclosed with the Scottish Daily Mail. What an absolute mess. And one of their own making. Incredible. Uh, you're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up, an exploding e-bike sets a busy London station ablaze. More on this after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You know my opinion on, on electric vehicles, and this latest clip has done nothing to change my mind. This shocking footage shows a stationary e-bike bursting into flames at rush hour on the platform at Sutton Station in South London. Watch it carefully. Smoke emerges from the two-wheeler before suddenly flames appeared. Four people narrowly escaping injury. Comes after a series of electric vehicle explosions, including last month an electric-powered tricycle caught fire while parked outside Buckingham Palace. Last year, three people died in London alone from e-bike and e-scooter fires, according to the London Fire Brigade. Time to get rid of these things once and for all. Now, 
Uh, it's time for me to bring back my panel. And uh, isn't it true that every time I see a fire, whether it's a, a, a bike or whether it's a bus or whether it's a car, it's always electric? No, Mike, this never happens. But they keep it's telling never, me no. Never, never the batteries in electric vehicles, not the scooters, no. buses, cars. You mean the highly flammable lithium batteries? Yeah. Never. never. And, and if it is, it's always because somebody's tampered with it. Oh, it's just well, they didn't tamper with the three buses that went on fire, you know, in the last two months in London yeah. alone. I mean, imagine having one of those things parked on your driveway. I know. Right outside your house. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, I just was in America and, you know, the electric vehicle revolution is already stalling here. It's very much stalling in the States as well because they drive a lot further over there and a yeah. lot of people that I spoke to were just like, you know, we had a bit of a fad. People bought Teslas if they had enough money. Yeah. But actually, you know, they're more like second cars there because... They need, they need petrol cars to go as far as they go. It's I like your use of the word stalling. They do. Perhaps they do. If you don't charge them often enough. That's exactly and right. And they've got enough charges. Yeah. yeah, well, this is the thing. The infrastructure isn't there. We have about, like, less less than, like, a fifth of the infrastructure needed to make them commercially viable. This kind of golden bullet of, of climate climate change. It's just it's ludicrous. And no-one wants to talk about how, un how un unenvironmentally friendly lithium no. batteries oh, are. It's, it's so they're ludicrous. No, although the Advertising Standards Authority has actually stopped BMW from claiming that it's a zero-emissions car. Yeah. Because they're like, it's not. It's you not, can't yeah. claim it. But I've got something even better for you. I've got a picture which was sent to me on Twitter today. Uh, social media. Uh, the picture's coming. And I don't know if it's a real picture, but there's no reason for it to, to suspect that it's not. And basically what you've got is a van there which has got a message on the back saying, installing electric vehicle chargers across the UK, um, but it's filling up with petrol. <laughs> and a petrol station. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Um, well, it's going to travel the UK, hasn't it? Well, it has to, to travel serious. a long way. How's it going to do that right. with an electric battery? And, and everybody knows if you do have an electric car, once you get to the electric charge point, usually at least half of them aren't working, mm. and the other half have got somebody plugged into them. Yeah. yeah. So you have to wait about an hour. A guy at once did a, an experiment from Sky News, and he drove from London to Glasgow in an electric car. It took him 15 hours. Because Ridiculous. you had to keep stopping to fill up with wow. charge, but every time you stopped, they had to wait an hour to get onto the charge point because we just don't have the infrastructure. Yeah, wow. exactly. And do we want the infrastructure? Not, not particularly. Not when they burst. Well, they're, not, in they're not great for our roads as well. I mean, and also they make all the potholes worse. How, well, why do you think they're worth so third more than normal cars? Mm. Yeah. I might sound like a broken record, but it really is increasing our reliance on China as well. That's also true. Yeah. We're going to yeah. get a load of new electric vehicles coming through from China into Europe. Well, they've killing bought, off all they've the cornered the EV, bat uh, EV battery uh, market. They're the, yeah. they're basically the only sole, pro yeah. the sole providers. Yeah. Our obsession with net zero actually did not align with our national security does, no. strategy does at all. Not, does no, not. It really and didn't. if you look at the mining in uh, places like Congo, yeah. um, it's horrible. It's and those civil wars that are breaking out because of Horrific. lithium yeah. and things like that. I think lithium's there, but um, it is usually endorsed by China yeah. as well. And one of these things will will cause it. I mean, they already have, but they'll cause more fires. And I mean, everyone's lucky to get out of that one. But there's been people who've who've had them go up. In it's funny, isn't it? You know, fewer forest fires never before, but they're um, you know they make the headlines all the time. Yeah. And every time you get one of these these fires on a bus or a right. car. It's it, it's nothing no. to do with the battery at all. No. It's a real double standard when it comes to fires yes. and environmental lobby. Yes, and it's lobby. really toxic as well, the stuff that comes off it. But let's talk about something else which is toxic, the Foreign Office, right? Mm. The Foreign Office, Her Majesty's Foreign Office, which I've happened to have been in. It's the most beautiful building um, in that part of the world. It's got this incredible freeze as you walk in. There's a sweeping staircase that's going up. Apparently, there's been a report done that the paintings are a bit off because they remind people of our colonial past and... Surely we must change the name of the Foreign Office because it's horrible. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, there are a number of things that are incredibly concerning about that report. So concerning, yes. I, I think it's actually really dangerous. I'll, mm. I'll give you three reasons okay. why. First of all, I think that this report actually undermines the machinery of democracy itself. One of its recommendations is that mandates shouldn't be um, limited to the tenure of a minister. Yes. Well, <laughs> Hello, this is the tail wagging the dog right. here. Of course mandates should be um, tied to the tenure of the minister and the mm. party who's in power. Right. You shouldn't put the office above the minister. Right. Secondly, it's, it seems to be written by the most dweeby, lacklustre, weak-kneed group of... Do you mean civil unambitious, servants? Unambitious, civil unambitious servants. and apologetic people. So apparently we're not great anymore. No. We're a middling, I, I think it uses the word middling somewhere, middling offshore country. Yeah. We should be a team player, Medium not power, a leader. Yeah, that's Medium what power. it was, especially post-Brexit. Why, why, sh why should we um, not think of ourselves as great and aspire to be a leader and only right. a middling 
team player, no thanks. Right. And connected to that point, the third point is, I think part of the reason it's so dangerous is it's really seeking to detach us from the past. Yes. We rely too much on our history. And that's, of course, emblemised in this idea that we should remove so many colonial yeah. era paintings. If you've been to the Foreign Office, probably one of the best things about it is this is exquisitely designed. It is beautiful. The paintings mm -hmm. are beautiful. Yeah. It's a very impressive building, which no doubt has had quite a formidable influence on world leaders who mm. have visited yeah. it. But this idea that we shouldn't be leaning upon our past is wrong because, of course, our past makes us who we are. I think, make no mistake, this is about a deliberate attempt to detach us from our past and therefore who we are, to leave us unmoored. Yes, and I was reading um, a piece today about there is one particular individual who I think resigned from the Foreign Office as one of the chief civil servants when Liz Truss got the job um, and has done nothing but sort of knock British foreign policy as a civil servant and has talked endlessly about how, well, we didn't want to do that or we didn't want to do this it's almost as though foreign policy in this country is politicised. It's not really, is it? Well, not really. No. I mean, I, one of the things that struck me was the, the recommendations from this report was it was written from a very specific worldview, which is the whole Britain is now irrelevant post-Brexit. So yes. it's a kind of like the permissive Brexit bashing. And therefore, we have to live in a world where we are basically apologising constantly for the past. I mean, you talked about climate reparations for the mm -hmm. love of God. Mm. And I think, it, one, it really underestimated the power of soft power and actually how you can woo a lot of foreign diplomats by by actually giving them the pomp and circumstance that they like, like they have something to buy into. But also, it's like you said, very unambitious. Like we're supposed to just constantly be apologetic about our past. So yes. in, in a way, it's like you, you, they're giving themselves permission to actually look down on Britain, especially because we did the great crime of, of, of voting for Brexit and all of that. But at the same time, they want us to mould this, this now third tier power in the image that they, they are, which yeah. is give all of your money to these kind of, you know, reparations, climate, climate change apologists, groups of people. So I, I don't really know what they're, they're, they're looking for. But these for are the here. people that walk around telling us that we're the laughing stock of Europe and, you know, that if we believe the ECHR will be, you know, pariahs in the face of the world. I found a piece I wanted to mention earlier. The report author is a guy called Mozan Malik, briefly Director General for Africa yeah. and previously British Ambassador to Indonesia. And this is a guy who resigned as a Director General after Liz Truss um, moved a policy, right? Um, he's also complained in The Guardian that the Foreign Office Dominic Raab had, in his words, a reputation for being extremely demanding. I.e., you, doing his you know, job. the minister actually guy's... wanted him to do something and he'd found that problematic. A lot, of, a lot of civil servants, I find, especially when they're connected to the Foreign Office, um, and I'm sure no-one could argue with this point, there is a kind of the wrong kind of prestige around civil servants that are connected to it. They live in an echo chamber yeah. and they haven't kind of stepped, they haven't actually existed amongst like main Britain. No. And the, it is very Westminster bubble It's much worse meeting. than it is political really Westminster. Worse, yeah. It's kind of, you know, yeah, woke Westminster. It's woke, it? it's this, and they live in this strange bubble when actually if you go up north and you go actually meet people and speak to people, most people acknowledge right. there's stuff in our past we're not particularly proud of, but it is who we are. But actually there's most we can be proud of a lot. Right. And you, we can, can be proud of what this country has done that's positive around the world. We've actually made the blueprint in how aid should be investment mm. and we use that today still and it isn't like a lot of our soft power where we actually don't give a lot of aid now it is investment yeah. and we keep those relationships and we build in grassroots communities you know we're not giving money to oxfam anymore we're giving Thank it God to grassroots that. Yeah. Small Don't give money to Oxfam. Charities, so, you know, yeah. we created a, we've done a lot of positive right. things. Exactly. And also, you know, they give the impression that people wandering whiny. around the streets of Derby talking about how great it was when, you know, whoever it was was the Foreign Secretary in 1839 and all the great <laughs> things he did uh, for the Indonesian continent. You know, yeah. nobody does that. Nobody talks about that. This idea of taking the paintings down. I mean, imagine it's imagine the idea of um, Italians saying, oh, we mustn't have any more classical right. Roman busts in our right. government buildings. It's absolute nonsense. Let's what, cover I mean, up the Sistine Chapel. What you exactly? You know, because, you know, the Catholics it's weren't insane. very nice back then. Well, what what is, this is why I actually the think these people, goes. Don't, right. they, these people don't like Britain. This, no. They're trying to mould... In, in their own little bubble, the country in the, in their image. They're not, they're not people you can tell that have been elected to be responsible for this country and for the reputation of this country. Because for them to suggest this actually shows that 
they're really quite disconnected from reality. Of course, they can have these these views and be unapologetic about yeah. it. They're not yeah, flying to Nigeria or Indonesia or China and representing Great Britain. They don't have any great responsibility on their shoulders. They just live in this bubble where they, they feel adjacent to power and they think, actually, this is what Britain should look like because I'm, I work in the Foreign Office and therefore I know everything. Right. Yeah. How about this yeah. for soft power? BBC spends £400,000 on school fees for just 20 children of foreign-based journalists. This is how the BBC spends your tax dollars, as I like to well, say. You know, What's going on? This, this kind of thing isn't unheard of, you know, both for uh, government and also private workers. Uh, I think the problem in this case is that we're paying for it. Yeah. It's the, the BBC doesn't have a subscription model. It's not a normal company. Yeah. Um, it exists by virtue of the TV tax that right. we all pay. And I think that's what's really objection about this. So an organisation is paying 400000 on private school fees, while at the same time about 1,000 people a week are criminalised for not paying their yes. TV licence, exactly. which pays for those school fees. Right. It is outrageous. But the thing yeah. is, I think we wouldn't have a problem with this if we actually, if the, most of the general public felt that the, the, the value that they're getting from the service that they're forced to pay for, for the, in the form of the BBC is worth it. That's the thing. Most people don't want to comb through the finances of public institutions and say, oh, but you're spending money on this person's school fees and stuff like that. Most people generally don't care. Right. But the fact that we are forced to pay for a value that I think, by and large, most of the country doesn't think that it's worth the value for how much we pay for it. That's why people get incensed yeah. by this. I don't think it's mm -hmm. just idle people trying to... Also, the thing the, about the BBC is the that when you look at it and you look into it, the numbers of correspondents they have are quite prodigious. You know, they have more people in America than they need to have. Yeah. They have more channels than they need to run. You know, if you get on an aeroplane, I think it's British Airways have got a special um, section, which is news by the BBC only made for the people on a plane. Yeah. Then they've got, you know, BBC World only made for people in other parts of the world. You know, they've got BBC Arabic, yeah. which we know about has had all sorts of problems with the mass. You know, they've got lots of people who are based there. Why do we need to send somebody else there uh, with their children? Surely you make a choice when you're in charge of organisations like that, as I used to do, I was foreign editor of Daily Express. You didn't send certain people to certain places if to live there if they had like six kids because yeah. obviously it was not economically viable. It's not an economic Send single people to be foreign correspondents, you know? Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. It's not an economic consideration. If you can justify it based on yeah. your profits, right. that's fine. But this is this is this not is basically the nine for people the whose children are being paid for because there's twenty of them. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not acceptable. I do think there's an argument for keeping, you know, correspondents, journalists. I do think there's an argument for that again. That can don't fire them because they've had kids. Can, no, competitive, yeah. keeping it competitive yeah. for the BBC to compete. But you, there's the interesting point. The BBC misspends money. They do. I want the I want the content to be amazing. Yeah. I want it to be the best journalism. But then you're right. Why have we just got this these little not. pockets? Because right. they're, not, not. they're not. They're not politically. They're not politically impartial. And it's and not. they employ journalists who like tweets about Hamas. Yeah. So well, maybe um, they should focus all their energy and that's on that the problem. And stop that's the why we have a problem strictly. with this. That, yeah. that, this is the thing. If they said, okay, we're cutting back on all the fluff. We're just focusing on like local radio, which I think is a great tool for young yeah, people to come through is. in journalism yes, and media. Definitely. Thing. Local um, local radio and the core BBC news, and we're going to focus all our energy on not having a bunch of twenty-something-year-old rogue students writing on news briefs. That's I have no yeah. problem there. And then, uh, and then you can take the bits that you want. And the exactly. bit that says, "Do you want to pay for anybody's children to be educated in you know, <laughs> Hong Kong?" You can just go, "No, thank you." And I actually <laughs> like the idea right. of just hiring local journalists. Yeah. in a lot of these, they do that as well, though. But, I know up. that's the thing; they do that as well. Yeah. I don't think necessarily for a public broadcaster we need to be sending no, people out. No, they have it's, the best of both worlds, yeah. trust me. Yeah, yeah they, need to, they need to cut back. They do. Talking of um, Gen Z, as we were there, let's talk about the new Gen Z thing, which is apparently ditching traditional table manners. I'm surprised they even actually have tables to eat at. Exactly. Because they're all saying how much they haven't got any money, haven't got any furniture, <laughs> can't move away from mummy and daddy. You know, apparently now elbows are back on the table. Yeah, well, I've got a couple of Gen Zers at home, or yeah, Gen Z is Gen Zers. Well, I and I have Z to the, the, the table. American. The table manners are a constant struggle. I feel like I'm one of the only parents in the world fighting this no phone yeah. on the table at dinner. Right. And um, you know, there's definitely no phone at the table. Put it, put lock it, lock but it. But lots face. of people do it. They. They do it, yeah. and then it gets, you know, it's harder and harder for you to uphold these manners. I thought this was a really shocking report, yeah. actually. Um, and and they, they really think that that generation really thinks that our sort of table manners are archaic yes. and unnecessary. Yeah, and overbearing. But they think anything which involves them doing something they don't Having want to standards, do is yeah. a problem. <laughs> I mean, that's basically where we are. Well, I think you know, the whole Gen from... Z thing is, that, why should I do that? You know, I'm going to be talking about, you know, this new work directive in a moment in the world of woke. 
But I was listening to something today where people were saying, well, why should I have to work any overtime? You know, why should I work hard? I mean, Megan, you've said many times how you came from, you know, quite a poor background and you fought to get to where you are today, I'm sure. Yeah. And some of these kids, because they're relatively sort of well off, they have, they have no yeah, kind of I started understanding working. of actually be starting at the bottom. Oh, I'm not making you tea. Sorry, I don't make tea. Well, make some bloody tea. I you know. commuted it. My first job in politics, I was commuting from Portsmouth because I yeah. couldn't afford the London rent. Right. Um, commuting on a train from Portsmouth. Right. Um, so it was a four hour round trip. I got up at seven today and I'm still working now. Right. So, and I do agree, there is a sense of that. It's, um, sh should, would it, be nice for me to be able to afford a nice flat in London and do all these things and go out with my yeah. friends. I have plans. I have what I want for my future right. and I have to work for it. Exactly. And it's kind of... But a lot that, of them think yeah. they can just ask for it and it should yeah. be given. Yeah, should they? They've yeah. grown up Absolutely. No, and I agree. And to, with the table manners things, yeah, I do find that. And I, I hate to say it, I do think it's less of a working class problem. I'm sometimes, um, when I'm around people who are working class, I'm quite close to Gen Z, I'm 29. Mm. 29, yeah. Um, table manners are kind of... It, it was really instilled in you. Yeah. Really instilled in you. I do find it... Like less, work was. Less as a problem... Yeah, less right. of a problem with my walk, working class friends, all great table manners. Right. Uh, it is a bit gross, well, though, when people is, don't many, have them. How many young people can actually lay a table? Well, that's another one. Well, that's another one. Because the thing is, such if, a good because point. If, if, we're, if we're having conversations about the fact that young people can't don't even know how to use a fork and knife correctly... Yeah. Well, they, can they even lay the table? Because if you can lay a table, you yeah. know kind well, of Well, they sort of don't want to, because it involves point. actual work. And they yeah. don't want to oh. do dishes. They don't do anything, because you know, it involves really sitting do down anything. with you for half but an hour. But it really shouldn't but be Mike, an option. But, Mike, more to the point, no-one's <laughs> making you a cup of tea here. They're pouring you whiskey. I know. Well, that's, <laughs> what, that's what <laughs> Listen, the I'm one of those. I've actually never been one of those people that expects people to make me tea. I've never been one of those people. But I've also been one of those people who when I was starting out, and I've had many jobs, including sort of licking envelopes in a, in a mail room to post out, you know, you know, ridiculous numbers of mail shots to people. Yeah. You know, if you start at the bottom, you expect, if somebody tells you to make tea, you make tea. Yeah. You know, yeah. if somebody says, yeah. go and stand over there for 10 minutes, you go and stand over there. But they're kind of going, oh, well, I don't feel good about doing that. Well, the thing, the Instagram oh, culture God, has made them think everything that. is easier. Like, yeah. they, should, they, sh they should be able to put up a bunch of reels or make themselves an idiot online so the people on the internet can laugh at them. Yes. And then they can make money that way. They, they see people's highlight reels online and think this is what life should be like. Right. It should be easier than having to make someone a cup of tea or yes. run around or have good table manners, all of that. That's right. the it's problem. It's all unnecessary to them. Excellent stuff. Anyway, coming up after the break, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We're going to take a trip, as I said, to the world of woke and we'll look at more of the stories in the papers. Stay tuned. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingston City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, oh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're that supposed to it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk TV. Now it's time for this. The World of Woke. It's fancy a duvet day. Don't feel like getting up, thinking of staying home today. Don't worry. The government is going to make it easier for you to skive off. Of course they are. It's just the latest in a long line of manoeuvres by a so-called Conservative Party which seems to think business owners are the enemy. After all, what else could be the reason for this weekend's latest work-life balance abomination? For that is what it is. It's no longer good enough for workers to have the opportunity to work from home or to take the odd morning off to visit the doctor, something which is normally granted once you've been in the job for a while. No, no. Now, employees have been given the right to demand flexible working from their very first day in a new job. And that could mean requests for remote working, staggered hours or even job sharing. If you're an employer, you'll already be tearing your hair out with dealing with all the complaints from the Gen Z brigade about why they're not coming in. They now range from needing a mental health day to dealing with a pet bereavement and even not wanting to do any overtime because they won't ever be able to buy a house. And anyway, the world's burning up thanks to climate change. Sensible people, of course, are now suggesting this latest workers' right is likely to turn Britain into a couch potato nation. And stories of the increased money being spent on takeaways the other day would suggest they're right. Donald Blaney, the founder of Griffin Law, says the government should be legislating for growth instead of encouraging workers to sit at home all day. This will place an absurd burden on hard-pressed businesses. Naturally, there will be one lot of workers who benefit from all of this, the ambulance-chasing lawyers, because any heightened labour laws will always lead to more increased employment claims. The new rules will be enable people to make multiple claims of discrimination on the grounds of sex, age, disability and religion. And before this, employees needed to be in 26 weeks of continuous employment before they could make one request for flexible working. Now they'll be able to do it from their very first day. As you might expect, the less than Conservative government is all for this madness. Kevin Hollingrake, the Business and Trade Minister, says it's good business sense and it will help young parents, people wanting greater flexibility for their families and people with hospital appointments, if you can ever find one. Of course, he also praises the new flexibility because it will improve workforce diversity. Brilliant. Not one word about the burden it will place on businesses from the uh, business minister, because that is the world of work. The world of work. Anybody want to take the rest of the show off? You know, if you've got, you know. I've got an urgent why appointment. Why are we here? Isn't this overkill? Surely yeah. these two of us well, could be having a duvet evening. Exactly. I mean, this <laughs> not is the thing. in the same. It's duvet. not that kind of show. I'm sorry. Not the same duvet. You know. But this is the thing. We were just talking about Gen Z and Gen Zers. You know, they want everything this mm. immediately. You know, as soon as you imagine, you can imagine running a business, you hire one of these characters. They come in on day one. They say, "Excuse me, and uh, tomorrow I'd like to have uh, a work from home day." Mm. You'd be going, "What?" I've just, I've just gone through the process of interviewing people. Yeah. I've given you this new opportunity. And what now you don't want to do it? I think there is a big difference between rights and privileges. Yeah. And I think that's what the government doesn't understand. They don't understand the government's place in actually regulating rights and regulating privileges. It shouldn't be your right to be able to demand to, to work from home. That is a privilege that you get as, as an employee, if that's something that your employer offers. And unfortunately, when you give these people all these rights, that are really privileges without responsibility. Now you actually make, it's almost kind of like a, like a slave contract with the employer. They have no, they have no uh, recourse from these, these employees that are basically saying, these are our rights, these are our rights, but there's nothing in return that you have to give right. them as rights. It's and like the first thing they think of when exactly. they go to work yeah. is what are my rights as opposed to what 
do I have to do? But anyway, a um, couple of stories to talk about on the front pages. You might like this one, Laura. Did you see the Metro? Forever mm. toxins in our fruit and veg. Apparently, it's no good if you just want to eat why fruit would, and veg. Why would I like this? I don't want toxins in our fruit and veg. because I don't well, eat many fruit and veg. I'm... I didn't mean you'd like the toxins. <laughs> I thought I didn't yeah. like the story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, this is, that's a good argument in favour of eating organic fruit and veg, I suppose. It sounds very disturbing. I, I eat quite a lot of meat and dairy. I do. Yeah. But, you know, I went, yeah. to, I went to the Borough Am Market. I safe? Am I safe? I about, I about yeah. two weeks before I went away, so we're talking about it must be nearly a month now, I bought some tomatoes from Borough Market. They're still absolutely fine. Yeah. They were out of the fridge before I went away. I put them in the fridge a week and a half ago, picked one out today, and it's still absolutely, you know, firm, juicy, lovely. You know, you, you don't if you buy tomatoes in the supermarket, they they that yeah. would have gone they would have gone mouldy yeah. yeah. inside of about a week. So there is something to be said. Well, I mean, or even organic, the, what the labelling around organic fruits and veg are so I mean, it doesn't mean they're free of pesticides at all. It just means that they, they have fewer pesticides than yeah. normal um, fruits right. and veg. So even that is, is poorly One regulated. new story I just wanted to bring to your attention, this nationwide manhunt that's going on after the horrible stabbing death of a woman in Bradford. Mm. The suspect is a guy called Habiba Massam. Um, now, he's been described variously as a man from Oldham, right? It turns out that he's not from Oldham, he's from Bangladesh, and he came here two years ago on a student visa. And I've been banging on about this. It's yeah. not just, you know, that we have to yeah. be careful who we let into the country on the small boats. But some of these people are coming into the country, God knows from, from where. Apparently a um, third of them don't even complete their degree. They never, well, they never a bother. Third. This guy's a YouTuber as well. He's been on YouTube sort of, you know, showing off about doing various things. But anyway, he's still wanted, so I just wanted to make that point. Um, Daily Star front page. Is there any point? Well, no, this is this is um this is quite funny actually, this environmental right, story. Yeah. Boffs give cows the right hump. So um apparently some environmental scientists at Oxford University think that we should be drinking camel milk Ugh. rather than cow milk because camels fart less, which is obviously the most pressing, oh, so that's, yes. the most pressing well, problem enough, methane that the planet creates, faces. Well, in the old days when we used to talk about greenhouse gases, methane from cows' farts actually used to create more uh, of, of a danger to the planet mm. than, than aeroplanes flying around. Yeah, I'm not, bu I'm not buying it. The weird, the weird thing about these um, environmental boffins is they come up with ideas for things that we should eat that are so unpalatable. It's like this constant push, <laughs> it's a constant push to make us eat vegan food, right. which is processed rubbish, right. or insects. I yes. mean, really, nobody's clamouring and saying, oh, insects, well, where I can, can I buy my crickets? Well. I've eaten crickets and I've eaten insects, and I can tell you, you wouldn't want to would do you, it. Would you rather have a ribeye or would you rather, yeah, I'd have, rather a have a mealy yes, worm? Yes, I'd definitely rather have a ribeye. I would also, eat, I have, but I I've also I had... Camel steak. I've also I had... I would try it. I imagine there are maybe places where you could have one. But, but I have had I have had camel milk chocolate. Because oh, why? My daughter Did you lose a bet? The, well, no, my, my daughter lives in the Middle East and she thinks <laughs> that's an appropriate gift to bring when she comes from oh. uh, Dubai to see me. <laughs> Did if you eat it? Oh, I tried it, yeah. And? I gave it to my kids. It's not as good as what we have here. OK. Well, I can imagine. <laughs> I don't want to give any adverts away, no. but I mean, it's, it's not fruit and nut, I can tell you that. Oh, God. It's um, not as good as what we have here. You also, know. I don't know how they get... Ca I mean, I know this is stupid, but I don't know how you get camel milk. I assume the, the same, same method. Yeah, I assume it's... I yeah, don't but know, with, but with it's, well, camel... how do you get oat milk, though? Not the same. Yeah. Right? So, it, I don't know. It may come in a different... It may be a different that form was really of funny. milking. I just don't know. You really did sound like a 1950s postcard slogan, then. Yeah. It's yeah. not as good as what we have at home. It's yeah, true. exactly. But it's true. I think in the case of camel milk chocolate, case. that must yeah. be true. Now, we can finish up since you started off on the old eclipse. Um, any thoughts on uh, whether it's going to be the harbinger of something great? whether we're about to enter a brand new phase of wonder. Uh, no. Simple no will suffice. <laughs> um, well, I think it can't get any worse, can it? <laughs> yep. That's really optimistic. Yeah. It can yeah. always get worse. Yeah, can't get any worse. It can always get worse, and I'm afraid uh, it's going to. Let's not tempt it. No, don't it say is. such things. Yeah. Anyway, it looks very beautiful. That's a lovely It is a lovely, on, yeah. On yeah. the front of the Financial Times. You know, it's... tomorrow you're going to meet a lot of people that have got it as their screensaver on their phone again. Look, I've got the eclipse on my phone. But it won't be their picture. Anyway, that's all from me tonight. <laughs> You've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you to everybody. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, we'll be back, of course, uh, tomorrow night at 8pm. And uh, you know what to do. Keep it here. It's Salt TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. 